I met her for the first time early last summer. We had a conference with a group of Chinese academic and business leaders and people from the U.S. And I was tremendously impressed by her uh, clear um, mastery of the subject matter uh, and also energy and enthusiasm. So I was you know, really eager to have her come back and talk to a bigger group of people here at Princeton. I hadn't quite realized just how impressive her CV was at the time. And I, I think I now give even more credit to her energy for having done all the things that she has done. She is currently the CEO of a company called Enduring Energy. Uh, formerly, she was Under Secretary of Energy for the US Department of Energy. There, she managed a multi-billion dollar energy and environment portfolio. Uh, developed plans to reduce dependence on oil, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and increase low carbon energy production. So quite an ambitious agenda. Uh, before that, she was provost and vice president for academic affairs at Johns Hopkins. And before that, she was dean of the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke University. Uh, the thing that I thought was really amazing was she holds over 129 US and, and international patents and has started several, several companies as well. So, uh, very um, impressive uh, set of activities. Her talk is on why clean energy won't take our economy to the cleaners. So please join me in welcoming her. Well, thank you, Dean Patson, um, for welcoming me, me to the Woodrow Wilson School, and uh, also for Princeton for making this opportunity to talk about something that um, I think is really important, is how do we create energy security? How do we clean our air and the environment and preserve our planet for the next generation? And I have uh, one of the next generation in our family is actually here as a senior, so um, I'm very concerned about the next generation. I wanted to talk a little bit about the economic impact of some of the ways uh, that we could get to the President's challenge of reaching 80% clean electricity by 2035, or equivalently when I came in as Under Secretary of Energy, 83% greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. So if I go to the, the next slide, uh, a little bit of um, background here. This is uh, Grinnell Glacier from uh, Glacier National Park. It's a place that I used to uh, hike around, not actually the glacier, but in uh, Glacier National Park when I was a kid. And this is looking at the glacier from uh, 1938. And then as we continue to clip through the slide, you can see that over time, this is uh, about uh, 1998, this is 2005, and now 2009. And what we've seen over the last 100 years since Glacier National Park was named a national park is 50% of the glaciers are no longer of a size that can be called a glacier. And in fact, over the next two decades, the rest of the glaciers are supposed to disappear, Glacier National Park, which is uh, you know, very distressing, um, obviously. So you know, yes, I believe that there is a, a human influence on climate change. And there are things that I think that we must do to um, try and reverse this. So um, I, I show this slide because when I came in as undersecretary to serve both Secretary Chu as well as the President, there was the goal set in the uh, campaign to reach 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And to show you where my office was, here's the press, it's actually right there. So anyhow, it was in the horseshoe, shoe, as they say. Um, so one of the things that then happened uh, in the first year of the administration was we had the Copenhagen meeting. And right before we went to Copenhagen, there was a op-ed piece that appeared by Professor Richard Lester at uh, MIT, which talks about the high cost of Copenhagen and what would it take to truly get to 83% reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So I don't know if many of you saw this. It's in the Wall Street Journal. I think it was December 6th of 2009. And uh, I, th I think it's a, I wanted to address it in terms of a plan that we started to put together when I was undersecretary, working with about 100 people throughout the national labs and within the um, Department of Energy, and we called it the um, Strategic Technology Energy Plan. And I'm going to uh, compare and contrast it. And I think the, uh, it all comes down to what are your assumptions. But in this particular article, basically the nit of it is, is uh, if we would need a very aggressive, not only policy, but also construction implementation plan to achieve this. So here it says, here's one recipe that would work. And so in Lester's article, 
Uh, he says that we would have to deploy 30,000 megawatts per year of wind for the next 40 years, every year for the next 40 years. So um, that would be um, about uh, four times, as he said, what was added in 2008 alone. Our plan talks about needing to install about 5,000 megawatts a year every year for the next 40 years. That's still a lot of wind turbines. It's still a lot of land. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the second thing is in terms of solar, we'd have to deploy 100 times the amount of solar that had been deployed in 2008 every year for the next uh, 40 years. And in our calculations, we're actually looking at um, less than 1,000 megawatts. There's about one gigawatt, maybe two gigawatt total installed solar capacity in the U.S. right now, and we're looking at uh, keeping the pace of what traditionally has been done, the compound aggregate growth rate of solar, just continuing on. No, nothing heroic, but it needs to continue, and so that will require some policy. He didn't say anything about hydro. I'm going to talk a little bit about hydro. He didn't say anything about <coughs> geothermal. And in nuclear, I think this is one of the, the stretch ones, which is we'd have to have five-fold the number of nuclear power plants by 2050. So currently we have about 103, 104 reactors at about 65 power plants. So we need 500 of those. Our plan calls for about 60 more of the evolutionary Gen 3 plus and about 20, um, well, actually uh, about 20 uh, gigawatts of the small modular reactors as well. So there's a difference of about um, a factor of uh, 10 in terms of the total number of plants that have to be installed. In terms of the fossil generation, he talked about needing to retrofit every single coal plant that exists today, plus double the number by 2050. And we're actually thinking that in the plan we should be shutting down the ones that are older and that um, aren't cost effective to retrofit and adding something like, uh, there's about 300 gigawatts in coal, adding about 400 gigawatts of coal, but retiring some. So it's not a tripling of the amount we have now it wouldn't even be doubling. So you ask, well, why these two different perspectives? So I want to walk through the particular perspectives. And I think the reason why is it comes down to the last line here, which is, in our case, we look at the electric power system. Traditionally, it's grown about a few percent a year. On average, some years it's up, currently down in recession years. And in this assumption, it was looking at requiring an electric power system that was four times bigger today. So today, we have about four petawatt uh, hours that we consume per year, and we looked at going to six petawatt hours, which is about a 2% increase on average per year until 2050. And that really comes down to what the, the, the difference is in terms of this perspective and another. So um, walking through it, it was uh, an exercise we did because the administration has talked about the need to have a portfolio to address our clean energy needs, and we certainly agree with that. And one of the reasons is if you look traditionally at the time it takes to migrate from one fuel source to another fuel source, it can take anywhere um, up to 80 or 100 years going from wood to coal to oil. And we don't have that kind of time if we're going to achieve this in a time where we don't see a further increase in our global temperature. So one way to do that is to look at a portfolio. So what would the portfolio look like? Well, this is a, a couple key assumptions. There's really five, if you will, easy pieces or not so easy pieces to our plan. One requires energy conservation and efficiency. And I say conservation, we'll talk a little bit later about areas where conservation, where efficiency actually results in conservation and other places where you become more efficient than you actually um, use more energy, but you do um, more with uh, less, hopefully. So right now, today, this is a, an extrapolation from the Energy Information Agency within DOE that talks about we're somewhere around, in 2010, about six gigatons of CO2 emissions, and in order to get to 83% reduction, we'd have to be about 1.3 out of 2050. So we consume about 100 quads of energy today, and part of the plan would say that we really want to, using energy conservation and efficiency, see if we can't keep that con consumption flat. That's a big challenge, but that would be about a 25 to 28 percent contribution to the overall plan. And then the rest of it, so that's the first piece, is that it's energy efficiency and conservation. The second one is to decarbonize our electric sector, is to electrify our personal transportation and heating sector, 
The third is to have on a modern grid that can do the transmission and distribution more efficiently and two-way so that you can employ some of the energy efficiency opportunities like demand response. And the fifth piece is fuel switching. So using advanced biofuels to do things that are more difficult to do without a fuel, which is uh, flight as well as freight and heavy duty transportation. So those are the five things and I just wanted to walk through a little bit about, get into some of the particular details. Part of an interim plan, yeah, it seemed like 2050 seemed a, uh, a way far off when it first started in the administration. And then you realize when it, you see how long it takes to do things that it actually is not that long off. But we thought it might be good to put some interim milestone there. So 80% clean electricity by 2035 was what we started to um, focus on. So interesting thing that we learned from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act is that for an investment of about $5,000 a home, you can get about a 30% efficiency improvement in a home that hadn't been previously either weatherized or had a, a, a new furnace, which was much more efficient. So in homes that we looked at, and this, these are just preliminary numbers, but we, we'd see about $5,000 investment get you somewhere between, let's just say generally 20 to 30 some percent. It would take another larger investment in order to get above the 30%. And that, would, that doesn't require you know, changing out the windows to get to, say, around the 30%. But it does mean that you probably have an inefficient furnace. You're leaking around the windows. You need to put in ins insulation. Um, how do we then, so in one sector, the buildings, if you think about energy use as having three sectors, you know, buildings, both commercial and residential, uh, consume uh, about 40% of our total energy. Industrial processing, about 30%, and transportation, about 30%. So in that particular area in buildings, if you can get 20 to 30% of a 40%, where does the rest come from? And so the rest also has to talk, think about the generation sector and how we can be more efficient and not need to increase the amount of electricity we use by a factor of four by 2050. So this is just an experiment. This was an opt-in experiment that PG&E ran back in um, August, on a particularly hot day in 2007, and looked at by using demand response where potentially you would cycle down the um, electricity to drive the refrigerator in order to turn on the air conditioning, you see approximately a 20% savings. So that's where the working together, the, the smart grid, if you will, or a modern grid that allows two-way communication and, and the ability to do that, uh, whether it's from your iPhone or some other smartphone, uh, not to particularly use one brand, that you can do it either individually or you could have it done by a utility provider. So these are some of the things that we're, we're looking at and that's a challenge because it, it also requires behavior change. And so one of the neat things that I ran into recently at the Aspen Ideas Forum was some work by Balaji Probakar, who's a professor at Stanford where he is a mathematician, but he's looking at using lotteries in order to change people's behavior. And the particular, um, uh, I would say, uh, spin on that that he has is that he's learned two things. One is if you give not large, large prizes, but meaningful prizes, but more often, you can get people to change. And so he did an experiment with Emphasis. They have 17,000 commuters. And Emphasis did a study, and if I remember these numbers right, and I, I'm sure his publications are, are on the web, but it's something like they, they realized that if individuals would commute off-peak, they could save a few dollars a week, but also an hour a day of their time. And when there was education about this, you can imagine a few dollars a week didn't really move the needle. Uh, and surprisingly enough, an hour a day of their time did neither. But then when they took the, um, apparently the way that emphasis uh, employees commute to work is that they go around in buses. And by getting people to commute off peak, they could reduce the number of buses and save money and also be more, more effective. So it turned out that they ran this lottery system that Balaji designed. And within about, I think, three or six months, half of the employees in the company chose to commute off-peak. And the reason why is because if they got in and swiped their card, their employee card, before 8.30 to show that they had commuted off-peak, they got so many points into the lottery system. And the more they did it, they were in the top tier. And if they didn't win a prize in the top tier, they got another chance in the middle tier, and it just sort of cascaded down. So eventually, people that commuted off-peak the most won something. And immediately, they had a, a tangible thing they could hold in their bank account, which was an increase in the amount of money in their bank account. So that was pretty uh, astonishing, I thought, result. And then he repeated that with Accenture in terms of getting people to walk more. 
and it turns out that I think half of the employees in Accenture are part of the, the um, healthy program lottery and that social networks and communities are building up to compete against each other. And so there is a role, and I think that's particularly uh, interesting in terms of light of the school that I'm here at, in that you have psychology and economics and policy all working together. And so this seemed to me to be kind of an interesting combination and solution and hopefully um, compel folks to change behavior for the good of the whole. So that, I think there are interesting ideas and solutions to get there. I think it's a, it's a stretch, but we have to do it. And one of the interesting things too is that as you go through this, in, these, in the appliances area, of course the, the classic one is the refrigerator where I think something like over the last a couple of decades, the refrigerators have grown by 50% and the cost has probably gone down by a, a, an equal amount. And then people buy two refrigerators and have one in their garage and one in their house. So are we really using less energy? And so I know a lot has been said recently about uh, Javon's paradox in some of the ways, uh, particularly in a field that I work in, um, lighting, where the cheaper it's gotten and the more efficient, the consumption has grown, has grown <coughs> dramatically. So I'm going to show a little bit of uh, other people's work on that, just to say that I think there's a difference here between how we think about energy efficiency and in the application energy sector. So if you're weatherizing your home, you're not likely to use the money you save to go out and buy another home. But if you are uh, using lighting and it's gone from incandescent uh, in terms of lumens per watt, uh, improved by a factor of 10 down to the LED, you might actually have five or 10 or even more um, particular components. And I think about that in my own life, and maybe some of you can relate to this, is that I watched the uh, landing on the moon and the first step on man in the moon on a TV, one TV we had in our home, in the basement, can remember very clearly on July 20th, 1969. And today in my backpack here, I've got three TVs, full color, portable. So the fact that they've gotten cheaper, more effective, and more efficient, I just have more. And uh, by the way, that, I don't know if I said that that TV was also black and white back in the day that my dad actually built. So I think that this is something to be mindful of as we try to get to stick the, our consumption to 100 quads. And uh, just in terms of thinking about lighting, well, I mean, it's a particular, my PhD was in the optics area. It's, it's uh, particularly aggravating to me when I see parking lots and other large structures um, with lots of lights on that nobody is enjoying or using. And I think that um, at least I know that work that we did in optics oh, 20 years ago, uh, I ran across a, a data point that said that 75% of our lighting is wasted, which I can certainly believe. And I am staying at the NASA Inn, and I've walked around and counted the number of lights that are on that probably don't need to be on, and it's not just the NASA Inn I'm picking on. I do this everywhere I go. And then calculate how many of those particular hotels there are in the room, in the world, and then how much the company could save if they just turn off these lights that nobody's using. So this is a big thing uh, for us. If we look at lighting over, say, 300 years, um, what we see in terms of some of the statistics is that uh, we have increased the efficiency in seven, in uh, actually from 1300 to 2000, which is uh, on the next slide, the efficiency of lighting has gone up by a factor of 1,000. The cost has gone down by a factor of 10,000. The consumption has gone up by a factor of 36,000 per capita. So, it, you know, as we get better and better with something, we now see lighting used everywhere. And these are just some statistics. Um, also from the same paper, and let me just go back for a minute, and this is from Fouquet and Pearson, a seventh century of energy services, the price and use of light in the United Kingdom. So as I said, the only thing I'm trying to point out is in some sectors such as buildings, some of the efficiencies uh, we employ there will translate into energy savings and energy conservation. And in other areas, it may actually promote uh, more use and more consumption. So that's not necessarily bad. We just have to know it and document it and you know, realize that we're going to be doing uh, either the same, uh, doing more with the same amount of energy, and that's our goal. Can we do more with the same amount of energy? And in the field that I worked in for quite a while, um, which was LCD backlights and, and lighting, I was just recently at a conference with Corning on, on glass, and a lot of glass is used in display, especially the Gorilla Glass that's in the iPhones. And if you think about the number of handheld devices, um, it's certainly reaching parity with the number of people on the planet that are connected. And so Sharp gave a great talk which said in order for them to not use any more energy than they're using now, which is a corporate goal, you'll have to decrease 
the watts per inch squared of a display from something like 0.1 watts to 0.02 watts. So companies are aware of this, they are working towards this, and I think that gives me great hope. So I am, a, and I come to you today as an optimist. Um, I said earlier that, of course, of the three energy sectors, you've got buildings, both commercial and residential, uh, you've got transportation, you've got industry, and I think that if we look at most of the major companies in the U.S., particularly in the petroleum and petrochemical area, Dow has a goal of 20% reduction in, in um, their energy use by 2020. So that would be helpful, but each sector has to come up with this 25% savings in, in order for us, for us to hit our goals of the greenhouse gas re reduction. So if it's 25% for energy efficiency, the rest of the plan is pretty simple, and it's uh, how do we get to 80% uh, clean electricity by 2035? Well, there's conservation and efficiency. And then roughly, it's a third renewables, a third nuclear, and a third fossil generation, with half the fossil generation having carbon capture and sequestration. Now, this is just one technical approach, and the, the, um, I should say the tenets of this plan that we put together required no new technology that wasn't known today but taking into account improvements, but more of an evolutionary as opposed to revolutionary role. Now I show this slide just to focus now on the first third, which is the renewable energy. And I think something to look at here is if you see this powerhouse, this is hydropower, obviously solar power and wind. So this uh, dam here, which could have a um, powerhouse associated with it and a penstock to drive a turbine, will probably generate, it could, depending on the flow in the head, let's say 20 megawatts. There's no new great footprint there because there's 80,000 dams in the U.S. and only about 2,500 produce electricity. So we're not talking about hydropower to build new dams. We're talking about upgrading the existing hydropower and generation to make it more efficient. The windings, uh, reducing the loss in the power, more efficient uh, runners, uh, runners that are fish friendly so that now these modern runners will pass 99% of the fish without um, uh, morbidity there, shall we say. That same size, 20 megawatts, if it was done in a solar, will take 200 acres. And the same 20 megawatts with wind turbines could take anywhere from, you know, if they're 3 megawatt turbines, uh, 7, or if they're 1 megawatt turbines, 20. So it's just something in terms of the footprint of the renewable uh, renewables to be aware of. But the other thing to point out is that right now in the U.S. we have roughly 1,000 megawatts of solar. And our plan is to go from something that's quite small in terms of percentage, maybe not even a per, maybe roughly a percent of our electricity, and be 5% uh, by 2035. And we're talking about wind today is about 38,000 megawatts, and we're talking about having wind be 12% of the solution. So solar 5%, wind 12%. Hydropower is about 7% of our electrical generation, and in our plan, we just want to increase it by a factor of 50%. Even though there have been studies that have said we could double it, our plan is not to be aggressive, but to look at what could be done. And then the other thing is when we look about the grid in terms of firming the renewables, uh, my favorite is pump storage because you can do it at scale. So what happens uh, in this particular example here, and here's a... Uh, so-called the upper reservoir and the, the uh, bottom reservoir. During night when the wind is blowing, you might have excess wind. Instead of spilling it, you'd use it by running the turbines that are literally in reverse and pumping the water up to the storage facility. And then during peak hours when you need it, run it down through the turbine and, and run it in the forward direction and generate electricity. So these types of facilities, uh, so-called, so um, they could be even closed loop where the two reservoirs were two different mines uh, connected by a penstock where the mining shaft uh, might have been, uh, it could be a thousand megawatts or more. So they can be large. They can also be small. They can also, there's some 30 megawatt sites. So we're looking at trying to increase pump storage to firm the renewables so we can bring more renewables on. And I think that's one of the powers of this plan with the individuals put together. It is an integrated plan that involved fossil and nuclear and renewables coming to the table and figuring out how they can do it together. So the goal would be to go from something of the order of 10% renewables on the electric sector to about 32% renewables. And again, going from wind, which is a few percent, to about 12%, solar, which is less than a percent, to 5%, and hydropower, which is 7%, um, to about 10%.
So that's on that. And what we used the uh, Recovery Act for, in part, was to double, is to actually change the trajectory of deploying solar and wind. And so, um, go back for a minute. As you see here, we were going along uh, without the stimulus at that rate, and then we actually you know, were able to turn this at a much sharper trajectory. So again, I'm pretty optimistic of what we can do in the renewable space. So I feel um, that that uh, is on track. I would say that it's been helped greatly by policies, not only the production tax credits from uh, the EPAC 2005, but also from the uh, Stimulus or the Recovery Act, the so-called ITCs, investment tax credits, and the 1603 grant in lieu of tax credits. Tax credits are fine if you're making money, but a lot of these companies that are starting up in new technologies are not making money, so instead of taking a tax credit, you can actually apply for a grant in lieu of tax credit up to 30% of the eligible property that's placed in the service. And I think that along with the, the uh, is one of the main things uh, that has really uh, made a change in this direction. I'll give you an example. There are two companies out in California, I'll mention both of them, and I think there's maybe three altogether in the, in the, in the country that are really looking at deploying solar at scale on rooftops, you know, Sunrun and Solar City. And what they do is they'll pay the, the capital costs Put a panel on your home, and then you enter into a power purchase agreement, and you purchase um, the uh, the electricity generated at about 10% of the cost of the utility. Now, I I think that when I visited both companies, the other one, Solar City and Sunrun, and then there's Sunjevity, I think three out of five solar installations are done by one of these two companies. And an interesting fact, which I find, you know, one of the companies, and I won't mention which one, a third of their customers are Iraq veterans. So I think there's a, it, just an interesting um, observation that this is something that is definitely seen as an energy security as well as a uh, cleaning the planet. Um, so that's renewables. And then we look at nuclear. So in terms of nuclear, we actually have, as I said earlier, about 104, 103, 104 reactors at 65 power plants, about 101 gigawatt generation. How we get from nuclear being 20% of electricity to about 33% of the uh, supply is by adding 65, uh, excuse me, adding um, uprate factors to go from 90% efficiency to maybe 92% or so, which gives us about six or seven uh, more gigawatts adding 69 gigawatts of so-called Gen 3 plus light water reactors. And this would allow us to put in roughly, uh, by 2022, be adding about five nuclear power plants a year. So if we do that over the time to 2035, we could actually achieve the 30% uh, clean electricity, uh, I mean the 85%, 80% clean electricity by 2030. It also involves adding what we call advanced small modular reactors. And over the uh, 40 years, looking at adding about eight gigawatts from small modular reactors. So that would, um, now this plan was written prior to uh, the tragedy in Fu Fukushima. And so continuing to think about safety is obviously paramount. The new, uh, the new Gen 3 plus reactors are actually gravity passive cooled, so if the power goes out, they still cool. Those are different than the ones that were deployed um, in uh, years ago in Japan because the technology has evolved. So I'm still very optimistic and hopeful for, for nuclear energy because I think we need it as part of the, the tools that we have to get to the clean electricity goal. And then lastly, the 30, uh, roughly a third of the fossil generation. This is uh, looking at uh, scrubbers inside the Pleasant Prairie Power Plant in Wisconsin. And it has the lowest emission rate of any coal-based um, electrical generation plant. It's about 30 years old and it was retrofit in order to reduce emissions by 90% NOx and 95% of the sulfur dioxide. Now it's being looked at to do carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, we will need to have CCS commercial ready by 2020 and we set a budget to try and achieve that within the D Department of Energy. That will require uh, retiring some of the oldest plants will be retired, we'll retrofit the newer ones, and then we'll be looking at, in these new plants, getting the efficiency up, because the more efficient the plants are, the less coal we need to generate the same electricity. So, um, 
things like supercritical pulverized coal, oxygen combustion, integrated gasification, combined cycle. Right now, our plants can, with uh, some of the um, emission reduction mechanisms are in the high 30s in terms of percentage. I've seen some new technology that's at over 50% and trying to work with that company to get that uh, deployed. So I think I'm pretty optimistic about the fossil generation sector as well. And it doesn't require all the, the fossil energy that we use to have carbon capture. But it does require uh, doing something because the fossil energy currently is responsible for 40% of our CO2 emissions, or about 2.2 gigatons. Coal is 43% of our electric generation, and then gas, uh, natural gas is uh, about 23%. So uh, it, that's the making sure we can decarbonize the electric sector is important. And then we lose about 7% in our transmission and, and distribution more or less, depending on where you are. So having a two-way communication modern grid will also be important for conserving uh, energy. I think one of the biggest challenges, if you don't think the challenges in the uh, decarbonizing electric sector are big enough, is going to be uh, electrifying the personal transportation and, and heating. And I think part of that is recognizing that um, the, the kinds of technologies that we have to help us with reducing the amount of fuel, and this is from the uh, tragedy in the Gulf oil spill photo, is necessary um, both for energy security and we spend $300 billion a year importing oil. So if we could reduce our consumption, that would certainly be helpful. If we could reduce our consumption, even what we produce, that would be uh, dramatic. The STEP plan looks at not only reducing greenhouse gas emissions, 83% by 2050, but also the use of petroleum by 75%. Right now we import about 57% of our petroleum use. So it would make a, uh, a big difference. So electrify light duty vehicles. I, I just put this up because it's one that I found from the web. I, I, I could have had a leaf there. I could have had any of the other sorts of uh, electric vehicles or hybrids. But we look at um, by 2030, half of our vehicle fleet which is about 220 million light duty vehicles for personal transportation, uh, would have to be at least a hybrid. And so you may say, that seems like a lot. Well, it's 50% of the light duty vehicle fleet by 2030. So how are we gonna get there? Well, it turns out that most of at least the European manufacturers claim that by 2020, every new model of a car that they produce will be either an electric vehicle or a hybrid. Now, in good times, in, uh, when we're not in a recession, the U.S. would buy about 15 million new cars a year. In not so good times, it's about 11 million. So if you take a decade to get to 2030, and we're buying 15 million new cars a year and retiring others, uh, it's possible just with that dynamic alone, we would get close to 50% of our light duty vehicle fleet being a hybrid or an, or an electric vehicle. So, it's within the realm of possibility, and that's what this plan is about, is what is actually the art of the possible. Um, of course, that's helpful for light duty vehicles, and it does require battery technology. This is a rather large battery, as you can tell. I mean, it's, it's about the good size of a table where uh, about 10 people are standing around. But it's, it's, uh, it's funding that from the uh, Recovery Act that was uh, allowing manufacturing of the batteries and the technology development occur in the um, close to Detroit and places that are very depressed. So moving along, we also are looking at uh, how do we power larger vehicles, sort of transporting freight or many people. So certainly looking at uh, compressed natural gas and biofuels for uh, flight. You know, about 9% of the energy uh, use in the transportation sector is in flight. And if we looked at trying to use biofuels for light duty vehicle fleet, as well as freight transportation and flight, there just isn't enough biomass in the US. There's about a gigaton of biomass, which would satisfy about 50% of our needs if we could efficiently convert it into a fuel. So our plan talks about fuel switching just for uh, freight, as well as air transportation. And then off-freighting, instead of transporting things by air, is off-freighting a good significant portion to uh, train and transportation. So hopefully I've convinced you that there's nothing, I would say, uh, out of the realm of possibility if we could get together with the policy and some behavior change 
around how we use energy and how we generate the particular energy. But what is it going to cost? And so this is something that has been talked about a lot. And this is where I'd like to spend the concluding part of the uh, conversation and then um, uh, to open it up for question and answer. So we did an analysis, and it looks like, um, and this was uh, working with Boston Consulting Group. So if you take the energy uh, capex, capital spend, operating expenses, and fuel costs from 2010 to 2050, for business as usual, so we do none of this, it would run roughly $71 trillion. If we were to do everything that we talked about there, build the new nuclear plants, do carbon capture and sequestration, deploy the wind, the hydropower, the solar, uh, switch to hybrid vehicles, the savings from the fuel as well as the operations, it'd be more on the capex, but more savings on the, the fuel and the opex and efficiency, you'd spend also about $70 trillion. So to implement this particular plan, it's just one path, the net incremental investment over from now until 2020, from now until 2025 is one trillion dollars. After that, from 2025 out to 2050, the accrued benefit from the savings is about 3.5 trillion dollars. So if you take one trillion dollars over the next 15 years, you divide by, um, you know, one trillion dollars divide by 15, it's about 67 billion a year. You divide by the number of households there are in the U.S., divide by the number of weeks, it comes out to be less than 10 bucks a week, less than nine bucks a week. So it's about two lattes per household. Every week. Not every day, every week. So you just have to give up lattes like on Saturday or something. So I have given up lattes. I kindly have a nice, plain, uh, good cup of coffee here. Uh, that's what it would cost, and then we would get the accrual of the benefit. Now, there's something else interesting, and this is where I want to segue just for a minute into a project that I'm actually looking at now personally uh, developing. And that is, it's a 20 megawatt hydropower project. Probably costs between 60 and 80 million dollars. We'll generate uh, electricity to, at a 10 cents a kilowatt hour, just for round numbers, to generate about 8.8 .8 million dollars a year. So if you look at the, the year's payback, roughly 10. At the end of that, of 20 years, the IRR, under certain, under policy that gives you production tax credits, which is helpful, um, you have an IRR of about 7% a year, every year. And these things run for 100 years. And if you sold that asset after 20 years, you'd sell for about six to seven times revenue. Now, take that small example of 20 megawatts, and we've just talked about redoing our electric sector to the tune of about one trillion in net incremental investment, which is basically on par with what we're gonna do anyway. We'd have energy security, we'd have clean air, clean water, and we'll have assets with a net present value over $600 billion. Because those same assets also have terminal value, which is not included in these calculations. So, why don't we do this? And I think one of the reasons is it's, it's, it's a complicated problem. I've been an academic for 30 years, and, and so I think the, the, the dean will appreciate what I'm about to say. And that is the savings you get from the efficiency side of the house has to be given to the investment on the generation side of the house. Well, that would be similar to the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School giving maybe the dean of the engineering school money to do something that would help the collective good. That probably would not happen without the thing called a provost or a president, right? That's why we need a policy, because people that are saving in the efficiency sector and in, you know, if you think about the cost of driving an electric vehicle versus the cost of a gallon of gasoline, the GGE or the gallon gasoline equivalent in an electric vehicle is about a buck a gallon. I haven't seen a buck a gallon since I was a kid. I think when I was a kid and first riding around, it was 25 cents a gallon. So, uh, but those savings aren't necessarily going to be given to the folks building nuclear power plants. So we need a policy by which we can rationalize these investments and do something for the greater good, I think is uh, my pitch. When have we done this before? Is there another example? Well, you can look at the interstate highway system. 
that was done in this country, we did this from 1956 to 1980. We invested 0.43% of our GDP. To do this plan would require only 0.36% investment of our GDP. So we have done it before, and we can do it again. It will require policy. So let me just uh, conclude by saying, not only require policy, it will require all of us to act. It will generate jobs. And this is where I go to the individual actions part of the talk. So, many of you know this, but we can all make a difference. If you change one frequently used incandescent bulb with a CFL, if every home in the country did that, just one frequently used light bulb, you'd save enough energy to power three million homes. If we were to use you know, front-loading washing machines with cold water, and if you've watched Ellen DeGeneres in her soap opera, I thought that was hilarious. Um, she is actually, I think it's what, uh, Days of Our Tide or something like that. I, I don't want to use any brand name, but cold water detergent. If you just do four out of five of your loads in cold water, which does a nice job of cleaning and keeps your colors um, not from fading, uh, you can save about two or three percent of the total energy spend in the United States. So these are simple things that we can all do. By having a, a meter where we turn off lights or do demand response, we have the potential maybe to reach 20% uh, savings in the way we use energy in our home. If we put our laptop on uh, sleep instead of keeping it alive, you know, I think the average laptop uses what, about 80 to 100 watts? It goes down to what? Oh, um, I, I might be off by no watt factor there. Anyway, it goes down by a factor of 100, that I know. So these are simple things that we can do uh, individually. I actually no longer own a car, and I walk to work, and um, I feel all the better for it. Anyway, this is a quote that I'm going to conclude with two slides and open up for questions. I think this is really uh, fascinating. So Thomas Edison, you know, arguably the father of the U.S. electric system, said, sunshine is a form of energy, and the winds and the tides are manifestations of energy. Do we use them? Oh, no. We burn up wood and coal as renters burn up the front fence for fuel. We live like squatters, not as if we own the property. And I think it's time we start living like we own the property. So um, I'll just end with this sort of slide of, of the earth. And if you look really closely, you can see this was uh, taken, obviously, from the famous photo from the Apollo mission. And you see just a very thin atmosphere, like a blue little ring that covers the globe. And it's almost like the, you know, the shell of an egg. And that's what is protecting us. And we can act to make sure that we don't crack that. So if there, um, I'd just like to thank you for uh, having me come here to talk about some of the things that I've learned along the way and to um, ask you to help us in reaching these goals. Thank you.